the opening scripture that I'm about to read so happens to be the very next chapter. I always read a relevant verse to what I am preaching before I pray. I, I want to impart upon you what it is that we are about to discuss. So we turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read verses 12 and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in praise and thanksgiving for all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you have yet to do in our lives. Lord God, I pray that you pour out your Spirit ministering to the hearts of all those here and all those watching online. May your will be done here and your truth be shared to all. Ultimately, so that you may be glorified, magnified, souls one to you. And that the hearts of believers will be strengthened with a fire placed within. To walk ever closer with you. Reveal unto us your truth and your will. And place upon our hearts a desire to pursue your will in our lives in the lives of our families, our community, and our nation. Lord God, let you be our guiding light through this darkened world. Let us always be a beacon of your love and your light through the darkness. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Here, Paul is speaking of unity in Christ. This is something that is echoed throughout the writings of Paul. If you go to Colossians chapter 3, Paul speaks of it again. We look at the world around us and those who would benefit from it have ultimately, fundamentally divided us upon lines of race, politics, turning one against another. Why? Because they profit from it. They can only stand strong and tall when we are weak going at one another. I want to speak today upon this division upon race because I tell you as a Christian this is non-existent. It better be non-existent for you. Biblically speaking there is one division that is Jew and Gentile in the Old Testament. In Christ, we are grafted into the vine. This is no longer an issue for us. The only division is those who are in Christ and those that are without. Our race sure is important to us individually. God has created each and every one of us in His perfect will. To be in his image. There is only one race. We 
we're all human. Here's something. We're all the same color. Whoa, wait a minute now. We're all the same color. What are you saying, Pastor Chris? Listen now. The degree in the melanin in your skin only dictates the shade of that one color. Amen. Can I get an amen? Anybody who knows amen. anything about color theory, knows anything about color, knows anything about art knows, you can have one color, but many shades. There is one color, but many shades. And we should be proud, yes, for who we are. And we should celebrate our differences, sure. Not just who we are, but those around us, yes. But I'm going to tell you, it is a great sin to put immutable characteristics and the identities people would form around that above your identity in Christ. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. You know, I have said this for many years. In, in private conversations, and I'm going to share it here with you today. What matters to me is what is in your heart. I can be friends with anyone, believers, non-believers alike. Amen. Black, white, brown. What matters to me is, can I trust you? Are you reliable? Are you loyal? I care not what you look like. I didn't choose to be born a man. I didn't choose to be born with this complexion. I didn't choose my height. I didn't choose to be thin. If I could choose, I'd be a much bigger man. Because I tell you, there's so many things I could do more easily if I was a bigger man, I remember in my youth, some might say I look young. I'm, I'm really not. Sometimes I feel young. Sometimes I don't. <laughs> I'm starting to get at that age. I'm now in my 40s. Some days you feel spry as a spring chicken, and sometimes you get up a little too fast and you start to ache. I'm right on that precipice there. When I was a young man, when I was young, young, I lacked the wisdom to understand truly what God's wisdom was. To truly understand how God had created us in His perfect wisdom. But don't we all? Don't we all? We are a flawed people. Each and every one of us. <clears throat> the key here is to learn to let go of the self. To let go of the self. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because it's no longer about you. You know, if God loves all people, that means he loves people that don't look like you. Amen. Amen. Right. Come on. Amen. He loves you. He loves everyone. For God so loved who? The world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus didn't die, just die on the cross for a certain set of people that looked a certain way. For all people. Even our enemies. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes, amen. We are to love. Amen, brother. We are to love as God loves, and as God loves all people, so should we. We turn now to Philemon, but before I read 
in the, in the letter to Philemon, excuse me, in the letter to Philemon, I'm going to read a bit about this. Now, Philemon is the shortest of Paul's writings. It's a personal letter. It wasn't written just specifically to say the entire church, like in Ephesians and Galatians. Philemon is written to a specific person. It is a personal letter. So I'm going to read some backstory here to let you understand what precisely is the impact of this book. And I tell you, this is a sermon I have wanted to preach for so very long because it is so extremely relevant now. Philemon is Paul's only letter of a private nature. It concerns a runaway slave, Onesimus, who had robbed his master, Philemon, and escaped from Colossae to Rome. There, Onesimus met the imprisoned Apostle Paul. Paul wrote to Philemon concerning Onesimus. Paul sent both the letter and Onesimus back to Colossae. By comparison to Paul's other letters, Philemon is little more than a postcard, but it comes from the tender heart of a friend, writing as a friend, rather than as an apostle exercising his authority. I want to speak a little bit of historical context here. In Roman law, slavery was different than what we would understand it to be in the context of American history. One could willfully, of their own accord, sell themselves into slavery to pay off debts for a set period of time, what we would understand uh, in American history to be indentured servitude. Any slave could purchase their freedom, and their children would be Roman citizens, no matter where they themselves had been born. But to run away, to be, whether forcefully or, or, or of one's own personal will, to have been a slave, if you run away, you risk yourself, if caught, to be crucified. Crucifixion was a, a form of execution saved for slaves and traitors in Roman law. Likewise, for a slave to harm his master in Roman law would mean that not only that slave would be crucified, but the entire household would be crucified. I would also like to point out this one thing. Roman culture was very opposite of what we would understand in the Gospels. Rome, they valued power and strength and despised weakness. To be kind to a slave in Roman culture was considered a sign of weakness. So that isn't to say that just because in, in the days of, of Paul the, a slave could purchase their freedom, it doesn't necessarily mean that their life was good. They were a slave. They were still a slave. And their life was in the hands of their master. They could be, their life could be just snuffed out at the will of their master. Why? Because in Roman law they were simply property. And here you have Onesimus who is the slave of a Christian named Philemon who he wronged in some way likely in theft of property as he escaped and ran to Rome where he met Paul This epistle was written
written sometime between 60 and 61 AD and is one of four epistles that Paul wrote while on house arrest in Rome. What the Romans would refer to as free custody. In 57 AD, Paul was arrested in Jerusalem. He arrives in Rome three years later on house arrest. See, Paul was a Roman citizen. He wasn't just a Jew, he was a Roman citizen. And he had certain protections, certain rights as a Roman citizen that other inhabitants of, of the empire just did not have. And one of those rights was he could petition to have his case heard by the emperor. Now this emperor was Nero. If you know anything about history, you know this is a man who played a liar and laughed and sang as Rome burned. He was not what one would say of sound mind. This Philemon was written at the same time as Paul had wrote Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. This letter has served as an inspiration for the liberation of slaves. Paul's clear preference was to keep Onesimus with him. But he recognized that Philemon was his legal owner and decided to send him back so Philemon could either reinstate him as a slave who was now also a Christian brother or, or else set him free for further service to Paul back in Rome. Onesimus returned to his master with this letter knowing that Paul was confident of Philemon's obedience, but also knowing that neither forgiveness nor reinstatement nor emancipation was guaranteed. You will see as we read here these 25 verses that make up Philemon, that Paul is appealing to the man, Philemon. He is not speaking with authority as to say you must do this and must not do that, as we see in other writings of Paul. But here he is writing to a friend, a friend who came to Christ through the ministry of Paul. Philemon illustrates the breaking down of social and cultural barriers that occurred between Christians. Paul, a highly educated Roman citizen, takes up the cause of a poor runaway slave whose life was in danger because of his theft and flight. Social and cultural barriers are eliminated in Christian fellowship. <coughs> Lastly, uh, before I before I read Philemon, I haven't even got to read it yet to break it down. I want you to, to understand the significance in American history of these 25 verses. The Bible was central to the thought, rhetoric, and development of the civil rights movement. You've heard me say this before. In every great movement in this country, the church was behind it. It was proclaimed from the pulpit. The civil rights movement was no different. This was influenced by the essential role of black churches and preachers in the organization of the movement. Not only was the movement characterized by meetings in churches and the singing of Negro spirituals, it was also marked by biblical themes and biblical principles. A prime example of biblical language used in the service of the civil rights movement is Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, delivered in August 28, 1963. 
I want to point out that in 1963, this nation was far more biblically literate. Meaning, young people today who might read or hear that speech may entirely miss the biblical foundation of that speech. And we're going to get to that in just a moment. The speech reflected King's criticism and hopes for America set in the language of the prophets of the Old Testament. For example, he said, Satisfaction should not come until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's Amos 5.24. This was familiar language in the Bible literate America of that day. In the conclusion, as King soars into describing his dream, he dreams of a day when every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. That's Isaiah 40, 4 through 5. It should not be taken for granted that Martin Luther King Jr., the great celebrated civil rights leader, was a Baptist pastor. He was a Baptist pastor. The great civil rights leaders, whether they be black or white, were pastors. I don't make up facts. I declare them. The church was central to the civil rights movement. It would not have been possible without the church. Great men of God who from the pulpit proclaimed Christ, who from the pulpit proclaimed God's truth, and who from the pulpit preached brotherhood. That we are all united singly, singularly united in one voice, in one heart, in one spirit, in Christ. Yet the world wants to divide us and say you're less than because of the color of your skin. You're less than because of some other immutable characteristic, you're less than because of what opinions you may have. We are seeing a growing division. And look, I'm not pointing my finger in one spot. My rebuke, my condemnation, doesn't go to just one demographic, but to all. All! Both sides of the political aisle. Why must this nation continually come back to this point? We are united in Christ. Let that identity unite us. You may think one thing politically and you might think something else politically that is irrelevant your skin tone might be this and your skin tone might be that none of it is relevant in comparison to your identity in christ amen amen there is neither jew nor gentile bond nor free we are united in christ Amen. It is in Christ. That is the only identity that matters. You're in Christ or you're not. No. Without the pastor behind the pulpit in the 1950s and the 1960s, there could not have been a civil rights movement. And I'm going to tell you why. It would have lacked the moral authority it needed to be successful. Amen. I now begin in Philemon, in verse 1. 
Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved, and fellow laborer. Now to say fellow laborer is to say a man of God, one who is in the ministry, to say fellow laborer. And to our beloved Aphia and Achabus, and our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Do you know that there was no dedicated places of worship at that time? Not until about the second century. Second or third century. At this time, all places of worship would be held in the home. These were home-based churches. Philemon, who himself was a man of, of means with his wife and his son and therefore in his home was large enough to be able to house and, and minister to and have services for the church there in their city. Grace, in verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. Paul and Philemon were friends. He's not writing to a stranger. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. I want to point out the verse 5 carries a, a literary, uh, oh, daggone it, the word escapes me. Anyway, there's a, a literary uh, pose here because we have love and faith and then towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints. And it actually forms a cross. It is, it is to mean love towards all saints, and faith towards the Lord Jesus. If you write it out on a piece of paper, or if you have it on a screen, and you put love and faith, and then you put the Lord Jesus and all saints, it will be love to all saints. Faith in the Lord Jesus. It's interesting, and it forms what? But a cross. I want to point out that Paul was a highly educated man. Highly educated. He was poor. He was very poor. But he was highly educated. He understood this. That the communication of thy faith may have effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you. He's speaking to the heart of Philemon here. He's making it clear. Effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. He is appealing to the changed heart of a friend. Now, mind you, Philemon is reading this. He's reading it as it was delivered to him by the subject of the letter, Onesimus himself. The slave who had wronged him, stolen from him, and escaped to Rome. It was there that, he, that Onesimus encountered Paul and came to know Christ, became a Christian. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoy thee, that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such as one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. That is to mean who I have brought to Christ while on house arrest in Rome. You know, 
I want to point out an interesting fact. It's relevant to all of the writings of Paul here. You could include this in any sermon preached from any of his epistles. It is this. <clears throat> Sometimes, I should say even oftentimes, the greatest work of God comes through the darkest valleys of our life. Had Paul not been arrested, had Paul not been on house arrest, there would be very little today known of Paul. All of the churches that Paul started in Asia Minor, all of those churches, how many of them do you think still exist today? None of them. But his writings to them do. The legacy of Paul, the ministry that, that he carried, the mighty works God done through him, his real work was in his suffering and the writings that came because of it. Which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. What does he mean by this? What does Paul mean? Who was once unprofitable, but is now profitable. That is to mean this. Outside of Christ, one is unprofitable. Meaning, there is no work of God being done through them. But now that they are in Christ, now that they are a Christian, they are now profitable. That isn't to mean monetarily profitable. It is profitable in the spirit. It is to say, Onesimus was once <laughs> unprofitable to, to Philemon, to the church, to God. But now he is profitable. He is now a brother in Christ. Whom I have sent again, though therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, that is in of me, of me, receive him. He sent him back. Whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But why, so why couldn't he keep him? The issue of his servitude to Philemon had to be addressed. To harbor a runaway slave could mean that one could receive the same types of punishments that that runaway slave received. There must be a reconciliation made between Onesimus and Philemon. This issue must be resolved. That's the whole purpose of this letter. You know, we're going to get to this in a moment, but I'm going to point something out here, and you can point it out in every one of the writings of Paul. You see mirrored in the writings, in the words, and the deeds of Paul, mirrored the teachings of Christ and the deeds of Christ in the gospel. We are to, it's not just our words that must reflect Christ. It is our deeds. But he would have retained him if he could. But without thy mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. He's not going to force Philemon's hand. He's going to appeal to the goodness in him. But he's not going to force his hand. He had the authority to do so as an apostle, but he didn't here. There's a lesson to be taught to Philemon. There's a lesson to be taught to the entire church there in that day and today. You see, this letter would have been read to the whole congregation. The entire congregation there would have witnessed Philemon's response to this.
For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. But now as a servant, but above a servant, here we go, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. Here is the slave that had stolen from him, run away, and has now returned. And Paul is saying, receive him as if you would receive me. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. You see, there was a debt owed from Onesimus to Philemon. A debt, a wrong that had been done. But Paul, let it be known, was a poor man. And he's saying, his debt is now mine. I will repay. What does that remind you of? What does that bring to mind? But that Jesus Christ upon the cross bore the debt of our sin. Paul here is reflecting Christ. He is reflecting Christ as we all should in all that we do. Amen. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Despite all that I have done for you, he's saying, I owe you. I will repay this debt. This debt I will repay. Despite all that God has done for us, God says, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. After all that we have done against him, whom we have wounded, whom we have harmed, whom we have disobeyed, dishonored through our sin, God says, I love you. Jesus said, I love you this much as he bore our sin on the cross. Paul says, I will repay. Now in verse 20, Paul encourages Philemon's obedience to this. Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord, having confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto you, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. He's saying, I have confidence that you will do more than what I'm, I'm asking and appealing for you to do. You will do that and then some. I have confidence in you. Why? He has confidence in Christ in him. Confidence in Christ in him. Knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say, but with all prepare me also a lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. He's saying prepare a place for me. Because I trust in God that through your prayers I will be released from this. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Fellow prisoner. What does that mean? Fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. That is to say, his imprisonment is due to his devotion and obedience to God. He is imprisoned. Why? Oh, he didn't beat up his neighbor. He didn't steal a, well, a horse and chariot. I was going to say car, but they didn't have car. He didn't commit some real crime. This was what? It was a thought crime. Wrong thing. Wrong thing. Paul was in prison for what? Being obedient to God and proclaiming Christ. He 
He's a prisoner in Christ. Marcus, Aristarchus, and Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, fellow men of God, fellow pastors, teachers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. That's 25 verses. That is Philemon. 25 powerful verses. And what is, what is it telling us but to forgive? It is telling us what but to reconcile. It is telling us what but that in Christ, those that may be in the highest stratus of society and those that may be in the lowest stratus of society in Christ are co-equal, co-inheritors to the kingdom of God. Co-equal, co-inheritors to the kingdom of God. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free. We are all equal in the eyes of God. The only identity that matters is your identity in Christ. Should we, yes, we should celebrate who we are and who one another is and recognize the beauty of God's creation. Do not let those identities and that which is built, that society is built around them to supersede your identity in Christ. Because that is all that matters. We are seen in society today, not just in the United States, but we're seeing it in, in the Western world. One side says the other side is evil based on their immutable characteristics, and back and forth. The, I am not condemning and rebuking one particular group of people, but all. Because it is coming from all. The riots from last year are beginning again. There was just riots in Portland. There's a new autonomous zone in Minneapolis. The horrors that we saw take place in over 30 cities last year may very well revisit us again this year. And I tell you now what I told you then. Those acting a fool in the streets are not your enemy. The enemy here is the great enemy of God and man, the devil himself, and his children that seek to profit from our division by fostering hate in the hearts, not just of unbelievers, but of believers alike. Amen. Sure, there are differences in culture. Okay. Does that really matter? Does it really matter? In the grand scheme of things, whether one is saved or not, if your eyes are brown or blue, does it matter whether you go to heaven or not? If your skin is white or black, does it matter? No! Do you speak one language over another? Does it matter in the eyes of God? No, I say no. If God loves all people, I tell you, love all people. Amen. It's the world of Father and not you. Love your family. Love your friends. Love the stranger. And yes, love your enemy. You don't have to like everyone you meet. You don't have to go 
cook a meal for everybody you run into. Now, people who know me know I'm friendly. I'm friendly and I joke around. And when I'm out in the public, I like to make people smile. Well, that doesn't mean I'm going to invite them over for a barbecue. But I'm not going to be mean either. I believe in, in common courtesy and, and, and being kind and courteous to everyone you meet. Be kind and courteous. We ourselves should always be a light, a beacon of love and hope in a world filled with darkness. We are the shining city on a hill proclaiming God's love, His goodness, His, His grace, His mercy being the ambassadors of Christ to an evil and fallen world. And yes, when you live that life, the world will hate you. Love them back. Love them back. Amen. Amen. I've preached before, where is the love? Not just in the world. So oftentimes, where is the love in our churches? You hear me preach about fake nice. People who in our churches are so fake. So fake. It's blazingly obvious. And they think they're being cute. They don't like anybody. But they're putting on a show. Putting on a show. Let us love one another. Let us love all people. Let us love as God loves, and let us love what God loves. Here we go now. God loves holiness and righteousness. Love holiness and righteousness. God hates sin and iniquity. Let us also hate sin and iniquity. That which we see in the world, and here we go, most importantly, that which you find within yourself. Amen. And always, always hold close to this. That no matter what one's background is, the color of their skin, their socioeconomic status, no matter how different they may be to us, if they are in Christ, they are your equal. They are your brother or sister. Don't let this world, don't let the devil and his children turn us one against another. But let us love all people. Amen. Let us reconcile with those whom we have wronged and seek reconciliation. Let us forgive always. Love and forgive. Let us bow, stand now and bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in praise and thanksgiving for all that you have done, all that you have are doing now and all that you will do in the future. We praise you for your mighty works in our life. We praise you for your truth. We praise you for guiding us through the Holy Spirit, guiding us through your word. And we praise you for revealing your truth today. We pray that you be with each and every one of us as we go our separate ways. Use each and every one of us as an, your instrument to do your mighty work and will in the lives of others around us. And then bring us back again next week safe and sound. We praise you for your goodness and mercy and your grace and the saving power through the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. 
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.